Well, um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. I know that um, there's some people on the list who are in the rotation, um, um, but um, people are still busy. You know, things, schedules are building up. It's getting warm out, so um, um, we'll, we'll fill in the gaps where we can, and uh, once um, they're freed up to uh, come on in and, and share the heart, I'm sure the Lord always will have something for them. Until then, uh, here I am, and here will be anybody else who would be willing to fill in the gaps. And we have plenty of folks to go around uh, at this point. Um, just like to start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for this evening, uh, Lord, and we know that you've been speaking to our hearts. Uh, God, there's so much going on in the constant transition of, um, of uh, history society, Lord, um, and just the world in general, Father, with your church in it. Uh, Lord, um, it's, um, it, it cannot dodge uh, the effects or the consequences thereof, Lord God. And Lord, we know that uh, you will uh, make known to us, Lord, um, in time, Father, and uh, in the moment um, that uh, we need it, that wisdom, Lord God, to, um, to see us through. And God, we ask of you now, Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you see us through this hour. Uh, Father, you make yourself known to us um, through your Holy Word and uh, your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 14, says this. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance, his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Though he sought the blessing with tears. A.W. Tozer writes in his article, We Live in a State of Emergency, from his book, Born After Midnight, quote, Tozer says, The fall of man has created a perpetual crisis. It will last until sin has been put down and Christ reigns over a redeemed and restored world. Until that time, the earth remains a disaster area. And its inhabitants live in a state of extraordinary emergency. Statesmen, economists talk hopefully of a return to normal conditions. But conditions have not been normal since the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant. And to be desired to make one wise and to be of the fruit thereof. And took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. It is not enough to say that we live in a state of moral crisis. That is true, but it is not all. To illustrate, we may say that war is a crisis in international relations, a breach of the peace between nations. But that, but that is to leave much unsaid. Along with that breach comes widespread ruin, the death of countless thousands of human beings, the uprooting of families, indescribable mental and bodily suffering, the wanton destruction of property, hunger and disease, and a hundred forms of misery which could grow out of these other horrors and spread like fire over a large over large portions of the earth, affecting millions of persons. So the fall was a moral crisis, 
but it has affected every part of man's nature, moral, intellectual, psychological, spiritual, and physical. His whole being has been deeply injured. The sin is the sin in his heart has over overflowed into his his total life, affecting his relation to God, to his fellow man, and to everyone and everything that he touches. So the concept here that Tozer is talking about is, is pretty much painting a picture of what me and you are looking in society this morning when you turn on the TV. This is 1967. So Tozer was definitely before his time. And only to affirm the reality of the condition of humanity, that sin hasn't changed its pattern in how it reflects among a society or humanity. Tozer goes on to say, There is also sound Bible reason to believe that nature itself, the brute creation, the earth, and even the astro astronomical universe, have all felt the shock of man's sin and have been ad adversely affected by it. When the Lord God drove out the man from the eastward garden and placed their cherubim and the flaming sword to prevent his return, the disaster was beginning to mount, and human history is little more than a record of its development. So since Adam and Eve decided to obey Satan rather than to obey God, all that we've witnessed throughout history in the timeline has been a logical outworking of this contaminated humanity structure. And all we've seen, and the scriptures confirm it, is Satan doing and fulfilling his purpose through the human uh, individual. So then some will say to us, and some will say to you when we see this, give it time. Give it time because in a matter of time, you know, God still works through people. God still takes care of things. And this is partially true. And I've heard uh, many preachers talk about, you know, um, I'm, I'm a work in progress. We use these Christian cliches, these sayings, as if to justify the means of our experiences in life. But I want to read to you something that A.W. Tozer says about time. And his article says, time cannot help us. And he goes on to say, sin has done, a, uh, sin has done frightful things to us. And its effect upon us is all the more deadly because we were born in it and are scarcely aware of what is happening to us. So he's saying we're not even we're not even aware of the condition of humanity, meaning humans themselves who are born in this uh, contaminated state are clueless of the reality of this condition. One thing sin has done is to confuse our values so that we can only with difficulty distinguish a friend from a foe or tell for certain what is and what is not good for us. We walk in a world of shadows where real things appear unreal and things of no consequences are sought after as eagerly as if they were made of the very gold that paves the streets of the city of God. Here Tozer is saying, the way and the hunger that the human condition is in this contaminated sinful nature, it seems that they're actually striving for something significant and successful in life. He says they're pressing so hard as if it's actually worth going. But yet you have individuals, and you see it every single day, we have individuals who are in Adam's condition under the power of sin, Satan and his demons, collaborating and having conversations to try to resolve the world's problems with another individual who is in Adam's sinful state under the power of sin, Satan and his demons, trying to resolve the matters of this important word, peace. In understanding the condition, where, would, where do we think the logical outworking of this conversation will end up? And we can make political statements about the matter, but it's not a political issue. It's always been and it will always be a spiritual one because it's the spiritual condition that's affecting us. They can give me and you all these false hopes and all these false promises because it's in their makeup to make these statements in a cliche form to promise me and you a future. 
To promise me new hope. To say tomorrow's going to be a better day. Don't worry, your bank accounts are fine. Don't worry, America is the strongest, most wealthiest nation in the world. Don't worry, hey, we have a military force that will sustain us. There is no threat among us. They're supposed to tell you that with the blind veil over their eyes. See, here's the problem. Me and you can fall for the deception and start believing these projected lies and think that we can have a justifiable conversation when we're talking with other believers and saying, well, here's the question. It's actually divided the church and it's split it in half literally, if not in four parts. Who did you vote for? You know, I've been way last five years of politics and even probably before that has been the most devastating wedge that Satan has used to divide the church. He probably has been doing it way before that. But it's been the most potent sword that he's used to divide God's people among themselves. People have literally walked out, split churches. People just stopped going to church altogether. Here's, here's what Tozer has to say about this concept. And thinking that time is going to be the effective uh, tool to help us. Because time supposedly is what we say. We say, just give it time. Things will work themselves out. Oh, really? Tozer answers us with this. He goes, our ideas rarely accord with things as they are, but are distorted by a kind of moral antagonism that throws everything out of focus. Through a multitude of errors, our total philosophy is out of line, somewhat as our mathematics would be had we learned the multiplication table wrongly and not been aware of its mistakes. There's this illusion. There's this there is this cloud over our minds thinking, but somehow we we're trying to justify and thinking this is right. This is the way we function. Some patterns have been built to make you mean you believe that everything's okay. Everything's going to work out. Nothing can be a big threat. Life can't change just like that. One false concept to which we cling tenuously is time. We think of it as being a sort of substance flowing onward like a sluggish river bearing upon its bosom nations and empires and civilizations and men. We visualize this sticky stream as an entity and ourselves are helplessly stuck in it for as long as our earthly lives endure. Or again, by a simple shift in our thinking, we picture time as a revealer of the shape of things to come. As when we say, time will tell. Or we imagine it as a, a benign, as a benign physician and comfort and comfort ourselves with the thought that time is a great healer. You know, these are cliche statements that people use. All this is so much a part of us that it would be too much to expect that the habit of referring everything to time could ever be broken. So this is just the way we talk. This is within our culture. This is within our language. Yet, we may guard against the harm that such thinking carries with it. He says, the most harmful mistake we make concerning time is that it has somehow a mysterious power to perfect human nature. The most harmful mistake we make concerning time is that it has some, it is somehow a mysterious power to perfect human, human nature. We say of a foolish young man, time will make him wiser. Or we see a new Christian acting like anything but a Christian and hope that time will someday turn him into a saint. Tozer says this, The truth is that time has no more power to sanctify a man than space has. Indeed, time is only a fiction by which we account for change. It is change, Tozer said, not time, that turns fools into wise men and sinners into saints. Or more accurately, it is Christ who does the whole thing by means of the changes he works in the heart of man. So me and you have adopted this mindset because it's been integrated into us. Give it time. Things will work themselves out. The politicians will tell you, hey, this time 
You're not going to suffer the consequences that you suffered with the last guy. But yet, we've been suffering them for the last 20 guys who've been in, in, uh, in seats of, uh, of office. And nothing's really changed. The same promises are repeated to us. The same repetitious patterns are responded to. They just become more extreme. They, people have actually gone off and did uh, and done uh, more horrific acts with these so-called promises. Uh, some would say they're coming to their senses and realizing that they've always been lying to us. It seems like Adam is seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and now he's willing to do something about it. Here's the problem with that though, that if Adam sees the light at the end of the tunnel and he realizes that no politician can help him and Adam being in a contaminated sinful state under the powers of sin, of sin, Satan, and his demons and the politician being under the same condition, the same office and he's giving these promises and Adam's falling for the lie but he comes to his senses Adam doesn't come to his senses by the power of the Holy Spirit. Adam comes to his senses in his position of being contaminated, and his only logical outworking is fight. The light of the end of the tunnel for Adam is not actually accepting the, these projected lies and these false promises is, let's do something about it. So he reacts according to his condition in a contaminated state. And all the time, here's the master deceiver, Satan is pulling all the puppet strings from all sides. He's saying, yes, politician, yes, individual, I want you to keep projecting these lies. I want you to keep making people believe these false assumptions. At the same time, I want these people to respond a certain way. I want the impressions that they leave upon humanity, even among the church, to make them believe that they're making the right decision. And he's pulling all the puppet strings. So when they go to war, they fight against each other. Churches split, families divide. People put chasms between each other. They start grudges. I mean, people start hating and getting vengeful towards each other. All Satan's demons are doing, giving each other high fives. It's good. We've done a great job. Has anybody ever read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? He, C.S. pulls back the veil of the reality of what's going on. We're falling for the lie. We're falling for the lie. A.W. Tozer writes in his article, The Freedom of the Will. It is inherent in the nature of man that his will must be free, made in the image of God, who is completely free. Man must enjoy a measure of freedom. This enables him to select his companions for this world and the next. It enables him to yield his soul to whom he will, to give allegiance to God or the devil, to remain a sinner or to become a saint. And God respects this freedom. God once saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. To find fault with the smallest thing God has made is to find fault with its maker. It is a false humility that would lament that God wrought but imperfectly when he made man in his own image. Sin accepted, Tozer says, there is nothing in human nature to apologize for. Sin accepted, there is nothing in human nature to apologize for. This was confirmed forever when the eternal Son of God became permanently incarnated in human flesh. We've been asking the wrong question. We've been, we've been trying to philosophize and, um, and trying to indoctrinate um, not only church folks but individuals and trying to evangelize them to their view or to the forefront view that's present today. Whatever you saw on TV last night and whatever me and you saw on TV last night seems to be leading the conversation. Did you see? Did you hear? And there we go. Not to say that we can't talk about it, but here's the problem. And those of us who have been... Uh, drawn by the Spirit of God to be evangelist, if we move, if we move forward and we move with the first step thinking that somehow my conversation only needs to be there and somehow uh, think that I'm going to have a room of uh, opportunity to share the gospel with that individual, I, I assume a lot about that situation. I assume a lot about that conversation. But here's the thing. When you have an opportunity like that, that's the, whole, that's the whole process and step-by-step -step attempt 
to actually disclose these false presuppositions that people uh, people believe until you get to the point where you can actually build a bridge of communication and talk about that truth. Until then, you're only talking, converse, having conversations at a superficial level. There's no depth to it. What did you hear? Well, I heard this politician say that. And what do you think about that? Well, I think he's wrong. Or, well, what about this idea? What about this law that's passing? Well, this law is doing this and this law is doing that. What about the law? What about the law that seems to contradict what the Word of God says? What do you What do you think about that? Well, I think every person has a right to decide for themselves, and if the law enables or doesn't enable or give the right to the individual, um, are we really giving the opportunity for humanity to become in the image of God since they have a will to choose and not to choose? So the, there comes all these distorted versions of trying to have a conversation only to get to the truth. Here's where the discipline of apologetics actually comes into play for me and you. When we talk about apologetics, the whole goal of apologetics is actually a step of evangelism. It's for me and you to get to the place of presuppositional or the false projected lies that this person believes. Now that might happen within an hour of conversation. It might not. You might have to be, you might have to be an on, having, on, be, having ongoing conversations with this person to pull back the veils layer uh, like a piece of onion, layer at a time, layer at a time. Here's the problem though, sometimes, and usually, lots of times, even the evangelist, or supposedly the gifted evangelist, will pull back that first layer of the onion, and all of a sudden, well, you know, I thought about probably using a real onion at this, and I might do it in the future. You start pulling back and handing onions to everybody, let's pull out the skin. What happens when you pull out the skin of an onion? I'll tell you what happens, you start peeling that outer shell, and the first thing you're doing is, well, you're getting somewhere, right? You see, actually, the clarity of what this onion is formed. But the problem is, it starts affecting your eyes. And it starts stinging you. Usually the person backs off and the immediate, if you haven't had that experience before, here's the immediate response. You go into a state of shock. Your body responds that well and you pull back and say, oh, my eyes are hurting. And you project it to somebody, my eyes are hurting. Hey, my eyes are hurting having this conversation. You know, it's, it's too much, it's too much. And you've only peered the top layer. You've only come to the, to the surface. You haven't even got to the core yet. So all of a sudden, we peel back. And who's ever, any of you ever peeled an onion and you get the top layer? And then at the top layer of that, that, that hard layer, there's a film. You ever get the part where there's a film right there? We can't even get to that as an evangelist. We can't even get to that point because it's too weighty. It's too much of a conversation to have. And not only that, we haven't practiced the tools to actually how do I engage an individual? How do I engage that? How do I engage somebody who says, listen, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade is, an, is a wrong thing. And somebody else says, Roe v. Wade is a right thing. And they're your brother and sister in the church. And that Roe v. Wade person who says, hey, Roe v. Wade is the right thing and it should be, it should be uh, and remain in, in law. And that person says, you don't understand. I was raped by my father, and how can you say I should have my father's uh, child when the Bible says it's against God's law? Explain that to me, evangelist. Explain that to me, preacher. How do you reconcile these views? God says, doesn't it say? Doesn't that person will challenge you? Doesn't the Old Testament say that incest is wrong? That this should not happen? But yet you tell me that the Christian view is all life is valuable. Even the one that's done in sin. How do we reconcile that? It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's just the top piece of the shell right there, that onion. You know what we usually do as evangelists and people of apologetics? You back off. And you say, this is too much to handle. You know what? Here's what we do. Can I give you the pastor's number? You know, he's available and you just have to call him and give him a, you know, give him a, uh, give him a call, and uh, he'll make some time for you. Poor lady or poor individual will never see the pastor because the pastor is too busy, and he might have a whole lot of other things to do. And then what kind of conversation are you going to have then? And yet this person is sincerely trying to reconcile these matters. I'm, I'm making examples, and all I'm saying is that there's decisions that are being made among the body of Christ that are causing us severe consequences. Just recently, I was having a conversation with Marv about this. I mean, I'm, I, I don't have time to really listen to a lot of music. I listen to, I give myself a little free time on Friday, but 
I, I have to be tapped into the things that are happening in society because uh, the process of, uh, of the human condition is so intense and it's so extreme. We're on the verge of a big explosion and it's gonna be, it's gonna affect us all. It's already happening. It's just been this ongoing thing, step by step, explosion after explosion in various areas, and the church is going to be affected. It's already affected by it. Whether whether we're we're, we're resolving the matter of, of uh, issues of years past, or we're trying to help an individual who's hungry, you know, whether it's Ukraine or now the Southern Baptist Convention. Listen, <laughs> things like things like the Southern Baptist Convention, who is one of probably the second most powerful evangelical denomination in the world or in the country, let me just start there, in the United States of America, is, is now losing its ground. But here's the thing, it's been given this projected line, this mindset that actually can sustain itself and function the way it's been this whole time. And I was sharing with Mark that the Southern Baptist Convention has this view, and this is when I was being trained to church plants in Chicago, and I was doing, uh, I was getting certified for this. This person stood up, and this was 300 people in this audience, and he said to us, every single one of us, he goes, okay, so when you start your first church plan, make sure you get your board members, make sure you get your uh, 501c3, once you do that, get your establishment, and go ahead and, um, and place your, your name on your church, and then start gathering your congregation. But here's the situation, according to the statistics, and after your certification, in the first six months, your church is gonna split. And right away, that's a negative for me. Right away, that impression came off to me as, as, wait a minute, this guy is already leading us down a wrong path. He's already leading us and setting us up for error or for, for a fall. Is this the statistic? But this is how they think, right? This is the process. And the Southern Baptist Convention obviously has certain doctrinal views and how they function. Listen, and some old philosophers who say, uh, ideas have consequences, not just outside of the church, in the church as well. Ideas have consequences. How we process, how we think, how we function, we're going to pay the price. The scripture is very clear. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. This is a universal law. Christian and non-Christian alike, nobody can escape it. So then he stands up, and I'm, I'm already questioning the fact that he's already making us uh, accept that within six months there's a church split. So... This could become a self-fulfilled prophecy, or I've already structured it, or when it happens, I'm not going to be surprised, because this is what happens. But I'm not okay with it. It's already nudging me wrong. His next statement was even more horrible. He said this, and within your first year, expect one or two of your children to be molested. And it was at that point that I stood up, and I shot, and I turned, and I looked towards him, and I said, where are you getting this information from? Where are you getting this idea that it's okay to even make these statements or say that as church planters, we should make this exception to the rule or to, to the church and say that, one, they're going to have a church place, and then two, that uh, one of our kids are going to get molested. What are you talking about? He goes, these are the Southern Baptist Convention statistics. As a church planter, and you getting certified, this is what you should expect. And I couldn't have it. So I turned around to 300 people, whatever I was in the front row, and I said, listen, pastors, you future ministers, youth ministers, whoever it is, I'll tell you why. And the only reason why this will happen in your church is because you allow it. It's because you did not check everybody at the door, and you did not sit there and engage every individual trying to come to your congregation. And you let Satan play in your background and made an exception to it and accepted the fall. The only reason your children will be affected, the only reason your church will split is because you permitted it. Gatekeeper, pastor of the sheep. Now listen, this is seven, eight years ago being trained to do this. And I ended up planning a church after the fact, doing this with these ideas that they were teaching. Not, not that I accepted them, but this was the reality for them. I am, and I am not surprised that not only the Southern Baptist Convention, but many other denominations are going to come to surface about what they have been projected to believe, which is one big fat lie, and now they will suffer the consequences for it. it right? It, it's going to unfold. The logical outworking of believing something that's not true, eventually you will bear the fruit of that. You will eat the fruit of your ways, the scripture says, Proverbs says. And the Southern Baptist is going to do it. Now, here's the problem. 
Southern Baptist Convention has a lot of affiliates within the Christian denomination or the Christian Church, the Evangelical Church. Not just, it's not just Southern Baptist Convention. It's Southern Baptist Convention and the Pentecostals and the Nazarenes and the Apostolic Holiness and everybody else who's been surrounding them or actually in collaboration with them. So it's a domino effect. It's only a matter of time before all the other things are falling. This has been happening already. We've all, we've all been feeling the pressure. I'm not saying you can't walk around and say you're a Christian because the scripture says, you know, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah, but what, what are you not ashamed of and what gospel is being presented now? What are we talking about now? Because you're going to have to accept the challenges when somebody says to you, hey, hey, I'm a Christian and I love the Lord. And they see your Bible and say, really? You still have the nerve after all the mess that your church is going through and your Christianity is going through to stand here and say that you, you're going to project and be bold and, uh, and be courageous somehow. I'd say it's the most foolish thing you could possibly do. This person will say to you, if I were you, I wouldn't say that no more. This is where, we, this is where we, we're being challenged. We're going to find, we're going to have to find an angle of conversation on how to be able to engage these individuals. Now, I've seen this as well. And uh, I've heard Martin Luther King Jr. talk about old saints who, uh, who, were, uh, um, who were racially minded and he called them nonconformist. So he says these people are nonconformist, that they're so stuck in their ways that it doesn't matter what happens around them, and this is the only thing that they project once the, the situation unfolds. They said, I hope that I am dead before I'm forced to decide to accept something that's different other than what I believe. And these, pe these people hold racial views. They hold things that are, that are totally against humanity. They're totally against God. But they, they're supposedly declaring and declaring and raising the Christian flag with their views, saying, this is just the way I believe. Where are we at? And what can we do as a people? And how, how can we approach the situation? And I've shared and gave a little glimpse of it. To be able to have a conversation at the surface level and pull back that first layer of the onion, we have to train and start disciplining ourselves beyond just a superficial conversation. And not only learn to pull back the the. the, the the top portion of the onion and peel and get to the film because once you pass that film, it gets, it's all tears from there. It's all tears from there. No, we don't know how to do it. We don't. We don't know how to get into the depths of people's lives. We only know how to protect our own. We only know how to, we only know how to put a layer of protection over ours. And when somebody tries to peel back the layers of our onion, they say, oh, no, no, no. Hey, that's none of your business. We'll do it to, we'll do it to ourselves in the same process that we're trying to do to somebody else. And when it comes to serious evangelism, to really try to reach humanity for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's getting too hard. And obviously, um, all the technology that comes with it, one philosopher said, how do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? How do you reach a, re a generation that listens with its eyes and things with his feelings. I still see some good old traditional churches. God bless them because they don't want to. They don't want to let go or make any modern changes to to the state of society for the sake of reaching people. Because they say no. This is what God's given us, and this is the way we're going to stay until we die. And they only have two people in the church because this is the way it is, and this is the way God gave it to them. They're not willing to make modern. And they've been praying, oh God, and they've been fasting. Please help us and find a way. And people showed up at their door and said. Hey, you know, I'm here because my grandmother used to be part of this church, and I think you guys have an opportunity to grow. Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, we're not going to try to change your doctrine. We're just trying to make sure that we can impress it to the world instead of just two people who are coming to congregation. No, we don't believe in that. Nonconformist, Martin Luther King Jr. says. What angles do me and you need to find? I started by reading the passage in uh, Hebrews. Here's what it says again. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
see to it that no one miss, misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance, his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Then Abraham says, don't be deceived in believing that God doesn't have limits. And believing that it's okay to carry out this simple lifestyle until, wait a minute, God will move me. Wait a minute. The idea and the doctrine and the view of Southern Baptist Convention is this. Eternal security. Once you're eternally secure, you can't lose your salvation. So there's no way to forfeit it. And they're Calvinists too. So wait a minute. They're not literally actually exercising their faith. It's God who actually has drawn them and overshadowed them to actually draw them to faith. And it's really God's outworking. So their simple lifestyle, listen, it's God's work. Ideas have consequences. The logical outworking of that view is being played out. And I can begin to tell you, we've seen the stems and you've heard the news. People like, you know, Rick Warren and Jerry Falwell, Jerry Falwell III, all the falls that they've had. I mean, it, it, this mindset, so think about this, the framework that if, if, if these people believe and this mindset, according to the Christian uh, worldview of the Christian evangelical doctrine, that I cannot lose my salvation, and as a Calvinist, it's not really me exercising my will of faith, it's actually God, because I have no good of my own, you know, I'm, I'm a defiled human being. I'm not, I'm not worth anything. Calvinism believes that. They don't believe that actually you can exercise that view. And wait a minute, it's just God working it out in me and he himself is going to draw me. He himself will strengthen me. And it'll all be fine. No matter what, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to see the Lord. Yet here, Hebrews gives the first of five warnings actually. And I encourage you to read it. Read the book of Hebrews in five to five warnings, maybe some homework for you, and see when the Lord starts challenging the church and saying to you, these things were patterns so this way you would understand that no one will defile the things of God and get away with it. No one, everybody will reap what they sow. And that doesn't matter how much you look for reconciliation. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how earnestly you seek and cry out to God for recompensation to actually to try to do good and be the saint that you missed out to be at. It's going to be too late. And it's not only the Southern Baptist Convention who's, going to be, who, who's paying the price and who'll be paying the price. Here's what's missing. Leonard Ravenhill says this. The world is tired of hearing how the Lord Jesus Christ forgives sins. They're tired of hearing that. They've heard it a million times. They're tired of that. The world is watching to see if anybody can demonstrate, demonstrate a forgiven life. One who can actually show the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Not a partial portion. And not just and not just these uh, doctrinal views of the portion, because we talk, we've driven, we've driven service in Christianity to, to the ground. We've driven sacrifice of a, of a in the Christian church to the ground. We've driven compassion to the ground. We, the Mormons are compassionate. The Muslims are compassionate. The sheiks they have the sheiks have built a massive temple where they feed almost two thousand people every single day, and all their religious affiliates participate. And they embarrass the church of the Lord Jesus Christ literally by doing this for a doctrine that actually doesn't even hold truth. And they feed all their hungry. We have a hard time getting out of our car and giving the guy in Fred Meyer a cheeseburger meal for the first. He's not even begging for he's not even begging you for or me for money. He's so, he's so confused in his mind. He's obviously not right that we'd rather avoid him than provide for him. And the Lord
Lord is challenging the church and saying, really? You, you are my son? You are my daughter? The sheiks, the Muslims, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witness are pouring into society and they don't even get credit for it. Who do they answer to? To their false god who doesn't give them no benefit? They're all going straight to hell because of it. What's our excuse? Here's, here's the thing, because Hebrews touches on it. When he talks about the mindset, he goes, to live a peace, peaceful life with all men and to live holy. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Okay, what are you talking about holiness? So we've driven sacrifice. We've driven compassion. We've driven all this. So here's what people have not heard. And actually, at this point, it sets up a stage and it sets up a vacuum. Because all we talk about forgiveness of sin, but there's no demonstration of actually a holy life and a forgiven life. It's a very hard, and even those who actually say they're forgiven, they come up and say, you know, hey, I know that I've said to you and I share with you my testimony. I've been forgiven. It's been 25 plus years, but I'm still, I'm still a sinner saved by grace. They'll still use cliche statements like that, which is a walking contradiction. If you've ever used the statement, sinner saved by grace, it's a, it's a contradictory statement. You're pretty much saying, according to biblical terms and biblical definition, if we make the statement say we're sinners saved by grace, what we're saying is we practice the devil's and the demon's work a little bit in our humanity, but somehow God is helping us to walk through it. And this can actually be our Christian life for the next 20 plus years until we die. Because God, because God is not done with me yet. Or I'm, here's another one, or I'm just a work in progress. How offensive it is to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross to use these cliche statements to try to justify why we're not empowered by God to do His will, to do His work. It's an offense to the altar. The Lord says, I, that's a defilement to me. He goes, get it away from me. He goes, your lips worship me, but your heart is far from me. It's not even there. Forget about doing all these works. Forget about uh, putting on and performing before God. We can't deceive God. And he's going to call us to account. He's already calling us to account for it. We better fear the Lord. Not fear the consequences of serving the Lord. And ain't nobody told us, I'm not afraid of man. I'm afraid of God. That's what I'm afraid of. And I'd rather be afraid of God than be afraid of man. And suffer the consequences of that. And we don't have any piety in society. Because nobody can point it. Nobody, theoretically, the Christians are supposed to have it. Theoretically, that's how the Christian is supposed to walk. But go ahead and do something that's actually inappropriate in front of somebody who's not a Christian. They'll be very quick. Satan is on the edge waiting for you to slip. It says, here's the second portion of the passage. It says this. See to it that no one misuses, misses the grace, the grace of God, and, no, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless at any level. This is at any level. Like Esau, impulsively exhausted about the moment, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Incredible. It's true. And I'm embarrassed to say it still that even as Leonard Raymond Hill says, the church is more concerned about their stomach appetites than the appetite for the living God. And Leonard Raymond Hill says, we come to church to hear a sermon about God, but we don't come to see the Lord. We come to hear about Him. And God has had enough. Afterwards, you know, when He wanted to inherit this blessing, because He realized what He did, he was rejected. Me and you are going to hear about the rejections. We're going to hear the cries. But Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart were only the beginning of many things to come. Who would ever thought that over Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, even, even a Charles Stanley had his problems. You know, we talk about these health, love, prosperity preachers, Benny Hinn, and things like that. But when you when you pick up names, Benny Hinn, we almost expect that Benny Hinn in a health, love, prosperity, he's suffering the consequences because we see him, he's been deceptive the whole time. 
Who, who ever thought Ravi Zacharias was going to suffer the consequences? God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Here's, here's um, um, the thing that me and you can do. Is one, understand that the concept of living a holy life is not just being of service, being compassionate, being caring, but the scripture is very clear about actually walking with the Lord. In 1 John chapter, chapter uh, I think it's chapter 3, here, let me get to it. He gives us a very clear picture. In 1 John, he says this. Is chapter 2 here. First John chapter 1, starting at uh, chapter 2, sorry, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So he explains it. This is to the church. Hey, you have power. If you sin, you have power to recover whatever area. Where you think you're not sinning, you should humble yourself and ask God if that's something that you've been sinning about. You know, the, I, I tell you what, the, the sin of self-righteousness and these men who thought they were untouchable, God touched them and exposed them. And the Lord warned them, be careful, your sin will find you out. What you hide, what you do in secret, I will raise from the rooftops and expose you. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So he's addressing the church, he's saying, hey, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to live in deception. You don't have to believe this projected lie. You can do something about it now. Then he says, this is how it's confirmed if you've done it right. We know, verse 3, that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Verse 4, the man who says, I know God. I know the Lord Jesus Christ. And God knows my heart. Really? God knows my heart. He knows, how, he knows my sincerity. He knows how hard I try. Really. And that's it. That's, that's the standard. Verse 4. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. He's a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now listen. Here's, he keeps confirming it. The Lord says, if you sin, stop. Reconcile the relationship and live a holy life. This is how we know it. These are the evidences. To say you know him is to obey, is to be faithful, is to be loyal. God's not lacking in power. We're lacking in commitment in this area. It's not that God is trying to see us through and say, hold our hands. Hey, come on. I know. All right. I know it's a struggle. I know you're human. You're always going to be simple because you're human. That's not true. That's the projected light to the church's belief. No, you're not. You're created in God's image. There's nothing wrong with your humanity. It's only what contaminates your humanity as a problem. And God crucified that. The question is, do you believe it enough to crucify it yourself? Because if you do, the word of God says, everybody who wants to live a godly life will crucify the sinful desires of the past and its sinful nature. That means bleed it out. No longer exists in your life. And then he says this, but if anyone obeys his word, it's, oh, sorry, verse 4. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him, right? So here's obedience. And obedience manifested in our life. Obedience and commitment in these areas. Denouncing sin, denouncing the practice of sin, not leaving any room, setting up boundaries and structures so this way. Sin's not impressing upon your life. Because the more you're sensitive to holiness, the more you'll be sensitive to sin. The reason the church is not sensitive to both or understanding the both is because in the gray area. It lives with one foot in the world and with one foot in the, in the church and, and believes that it's actually living okay. Thinking that this is the position that God has me in. 
God called me to this position. Really? You look like an ungodly individual to me. You know, we uh, there's a there's a saying in the streets, real recognizes real. Ah, oh, Pastor. We know it. We, we knew the real preachers from the false preachers when they come out on the street. We knew the ones who were trying to manipulate and deceive and take advantage of individuals versus the ones versus the ones who were sincerely at heart, who were really sincerely trying to do God's word. Here's the conclusion. Verse 5, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Watch this. Whoever claims to live in the Lord Jesus Christ must walk as the Lord Jesus Christ did. I don't follow Peter. Stop, example, stop giving me examples of Peter. You know, Peter was an apostle and he was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had many flaws. I don't care what Peter did. Stop it. Stop comparing me to Timothy. Stop comparing me to Paul. You know, these were, these were great men. They were flawed men. They were humans. They are always sinful. They did sin. King David was a flawed man. Look what he did. Premeditated murder. Stop comparing me to King David. I don't follow King David. You know, Abraham was a man of faith. He's, he's the father of faith. He's the father. I don't follow Abraham. I don't follow Abraham's faith. I'm not a child of Abraham. I'm not a child of King David. I'm not a child of Peter. I'm not a child of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I'm a child of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my king. To him alone I pledge allegiance. He is my Lord. He alone deserves all my being. My money is not mine, it's his. My work is not mine, it's his. My strength is not mine, it's his. My family is not mine, it's his. And if I put it in an altar, the Lord will call me to a God. He says, why are you so close to that? Why are you harboring that so close? You act like it's not mine. You act like it's yours. Like you got it all on your own. Like you did this all by yourself, King Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord will call us to account. Don't. It says, you know, scripture, don't. Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. We can't walk around saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's like, really? Praise the Lord? Right? I have all that is you. You've given everything that, that you have to me on the altar? Your house is yours? No. My house is God's. All that is, my very, my very breath is God's. All that I am is of God, is for God, and for His glory alone. See, this is complete obedience. If we try to hide a little bit and shelter a little bit, and Christians do, like Ananias and Sapphira, you know, we sold that house for fifty thousand dollars, but I gave forty nine thousand. I'm making it look good. Look, imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, or God Almighty, will empower one of the apostles, one of your people, one of the people, individuals around you, by the power of the Holy Spirit to call you to a and says, is this all the money? Really? Is this your commitment? Is this really your time? Is this really your loyalty? Are you really loyal? Are you really a believer? Have you really crucified all of it? Do you think, do you think you've lied to me? Do you think you've lied to the church? You think you just come out of here and actually perform and put on a big old smile for everybody to see? You think is everything okay? You think I don't know? Because you have not lied to men. You have lied to God. You have lied to God. So the Lord paints the picture. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him. The man who says, I have eternal life. The rich young ruler. I call him the 13th missing apostle. <laughs> he could have been it. What did he do? The Lord called him. He says, hey, what do I have to do to have eternal life? You know the commandments. Oh, I've done these as a boy. 
Imagine, he's telling somebody who's been faithful in the things of God as a boy, do these things. I've done all these things. I've been, I grew up in the church. I've been reading my Bible. I, man, I know the law. I'm loyal. Look, all everything is committed. He says, yeah, you lack one thing, brother. What is that? Sell all your possessions. Meaning, relinquish everything that you think you own that belongs to you. Relinquish it, put it on the altar, and come follow me. No, as a matter of fact, don't put it on the altar. Because then you'll come back to it and pick it up. And put it back in your possessions and thinking that you have control of it. It says, no, sell all you have. And this way, you don't have anywhere to go ahead and retrieve it again. Give it to the poor. Because what are you going to do? Go take from the poor? No. Very strategic on God's behalf. And I think the rich young ruler played out the logical outworking of this action. And he knew, wait a minute, I can sell my riches and maybe reinvest them. He goes, no, God is saying to give it to the poor. Because you can't steal from the poor, brother. You can never get it back. There, it's always gone. You'll never see it. You'll see it enriched in their lives, but no longer in yours. And then he says, then after you've done this, little wake-up call, follow me. No, we keep driving by the person at Fred Meyer who doesn't even have a sign, probably can't even write. He's not begging for anything. But God is begging me and you to say, why? Why can you, how can you just drive past him? He's not asking you for nothing. How can you just see him? He's created in my image. He's created in your image? He is. He doesn't serve you. Here's another false concept and a false projected lie that the devil sped us. I won't help you unless you convert. <laughs> how disgusting and sickening is that lie? I won't help you and I won't do nothing for you unless you come to church, unless we, unless you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, unless we get on our knees right now, then I'll go ahead and give you these little five dollars that I have in my pocket. But you gotta show up to one or two of my Bible studies. We condition salvation. You know, isn't it awesome that God did not condition mine and your salvation that way? He meant me and you broken. Desperate. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word, Almighty. Uh, Lord, your church has believed a lie. And Lord, we beg for your forgiveness and to restore us back to obedience, back to loyalty, back to love, back to truth. Lord, we love you. Lord, we don't want to just perform, Lord God. We don't want to just say that we know you. We know you. And you've saw us through, Lord God. And you've met us in our most difficult times, Lord God. Uh, forgive us. Forgive church, Lord. And, and the men that you are convicting and the women and the children that you're convicting by your Holy Spirit to turn back. No more. To not give up. Lord, the blessing, Father, for foolish things, for worldly things, the things that have no value, like a bowl of lentil soup, Lord God, like Esau foolishly did, Lord. Lord, um, you're warning us that we won't get it back. We won't get it back. And Lord, we heed your warning. Father, um, move us to that area. Move us to that private, private time, Lord God. Move us to that 
those moments, Lord, where we can hear you and see you, Lord. Father, not only know you, Father, and have that eternal life, that completeness, Lord God. But Father, I know that the world is watching and Satan's finger pointing every single step of the church, Lord. But your word says, Lord, that we live such a way that when anybody points a finger that they'll be ashamed. Lord, <laughs> the church is the one who should be ashamed. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the exposure for the things that are not of God, Lord. Lord, and we know that you don't expose us to condemn us, Father. Uh, Lord, you expose the sin in the church's life, Lord God, to deliver us from it, to give us an opportunity, Father, to turn away from it, to come back home, to come back home. We thank you, Lord, for this word. Move in our hearts, and we thank you, Lord, we pray. In Jesus Christ, in mighty name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys.